Hello, everyone. My name is Elisa Ewan, and I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Teachers College. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for the Alumni Career Development Webinar Series featuring Matt Murray. The webinar series covers a range of career topics and includes speakers from a variety of backgrounds. The series is co-sponsored by the TC Office of Career Services and the Office of Alumni Relations. Videos of past webinars are available on our website at www.tc.edu slash alumni slash career webinars. Today, alumnus Matt Murray presents Curiosity-Based Learning, What If Curiosity is a Learning Tool? Matt is is the Chief Curiosity Curator of What If 360 and author of the book of What If. He has facilitated What If 360 experiences that connect educators, entrepreneurs, and students from around the world from Colombia to Kratovo and dozens of communities in between. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to chat me directly in the chat box. And now without further ado, here's Matt Murray. Hello, and um, first of all, thank you, Teachers College, for, for the invitation to get curious and, and share some of the work that I've been doing since, uh, since graduating from Teachers College many, many years ago. Um, and thank you, everyone who's, who's come on to join and get curious today on the, the webinar. Um, so we'll get right to it. Uh, really excited to, to share this with you and um, really kind of start uh, introducing what curiosity-based learning Learning is all about. And um, in case I forget at the end, I, I want to make sure I stress that this isn't only an introduction uh, to curiosity-based learning uh, and a little insight to some of the work that I've done in the past and some of the things I've been developing, but it's also an invitation. Um, curiosity, curiosity in the classroom, curiosity-based learning is, is all really uh, emerging fields. And I'm really excited to connect with all of you. If any of you have ideas um, or ways to participate and um, further this kind of curiosity movement, I have my, my information at the end. I'm, I'm more than happy to connect, hear your ideas, especially if you're doing work in curiosity. Um, I'm excited to connect with you. So again, this is both a webinar, but also an invitation to get and stay curious. Um, so thanks. Um, so let's get started. Uh, uh, as mentioned, I do uh, work in curiosity-based learning, and it's not, I, while my background is in education, I work not only with educators, but I also work outside of the field of education. So I like to start with this slide as far as what is curiosity with this, 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 this equation here, this formula. And I'm not sure if anybody knows what this is, and I like to share this for a number of reasons. One, because I like to laugh at myself because I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not good at math. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very very dyslexic with numbers and, um, uh, you know, science. I remember growing up science, even though my father was a science teacher, just terrifying me and scaring me. Um, but I stumbled upon this equation <clears throat> because I do work with entrepreneurs, engineers, and other uh, groups who are, let's say, are outside of the, uh, the field of education. And, and oftentimes when you bring up things like curiosity, um, they can be a little skeptical, to say the least, or think of curiosity as being just a very kind of fluffy kind of thing. So I like to share this equation for a number of reasons. One is to try to meet um, people outside of kind of my background at, at, at where their minds are. Um, but also I like to continually, um, I like to show how curiosity and curiosity-based learning is also a way to, to um, really, not only to co-learn with teachers or with students and to, to use curiosity as an entry point to what other people, what your students' background or interests are rather than your own, right? So this is an example of me taking something that I have very little, let's say, interest or background knowledge in, but it may be something uh, some of the people I work with are curious, and I, I like to use that as a starting point. So, so what this is, this is Ludwig Bosemann's equation for entropy. Um, so it's a physics equation. And what entropy is, is, is the measure of the unknown, of the un potential energy. Um, and again, it's a very scientific kind of, you know, based in science, but I like to carry this over to curiosity. And when we deal with curiosity and curiosity-based learning, this is the approach we take, that we look at, we take the approach of, of curiosity as a natural resource that can be converted into an energy, uh, but not just any energy, potential energy. So uh, while we will get into other ways to kind of uh, look into and understand curiosity, I like to start with this slide because um, even though 
curiosity can be all of these different things. Some, you know, what if, right? What if we can boil it down to a single equation to help everybody understand what it is and what it could potentially be? Now, if you were to ask me personally, curiosity-based learning or what it is, I look at something more like this. Um, I look at curiosity-based learning as an approach to education that utilizes an equitable, renewable, naturally occurring, powerful form of energy, curiosity. Uh, we'll come back to this later, but this is really the starting point, that when we deal with curiosity-based learning, that we do look at it, at it as curiosity, as, as an energy that can be converted to drive more learning. Um, who is curiosity-based learning good for? Uh, this, this is one of the things I love with a background in, in, in teaching everything from kindergarten to uh, graduate level classes and I think five different continents and seven different countries. I've had students from you know all over the world. One of the things I've, I've really enjoyed about using curiosity-based learning is it really doesn't matter the background, the, uh, the, uh, the, the grade level or any of these other things that we that sometimes factor into different types of, of learning processes that really as long as someone's curious, they're capable of not only using curiosity-based learning, but really benefiting from, from it. Um, whoops, I went a little this far ahead. So that's, that's who it's for. Now, when can we use curiosity-based learning? Um, this is why I love connecting with innovators and uh, especially innovative educators. There's, there's really curiosity-based learning is, is for, for whenever there's no time for, for normal. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we think about like, how do we innovate or how do we, you know, we, we want to, the, the cliche is think outside the box, but we still keep, you know, digging into that same box, um, and we keep using some of the same, you know, tried old practices um, to get new results. But, but when someone's really looking for something that's different from anything they've done before, um, that's one of the, the best starting points for curiosity-based learning. Uh, why does curiosity-based learning matter? Um, I think it's important to realize that it does matter. It's not just kind of a fun thing to do or a trivial thing. Um, that it's important because it allows for curiosity anywhere, anytime, from anyone, and without limitations. Um, and again, when you unpack this sentence, really what we're talking about is, is, is not just a method of learning, but it's, it's, it's a tool for, for lifelong learning, right? Um, and if you can think about, you know, this is when you tap into the, the principles and the practices of curiosity-based learning, it really allows you, your students, your community, to learn anywhere, anytime, and, and I love the without limitations. Um, there are some challenges to it still. Um, I'm very passionate about curiosity and curiosity-based uh, learning, so there are some things that scares me about it. Um, I look at the, the best way for it to work is if everybody on the planet is doing it. Uh, I know that's ambitious, but um, it really is where, where I'm passionate about taking all of this. So the, what puzzles me is how do we engage the entire planet to fuel, engage their education with curiosity. Um, I've had small sample sizes to see the results. And again, I get really passionate about what this could look like at scale and for the whole world, but it terrifies me because as we all know, the world is a, is a very, very large place. Um, but it is important. There is motivation behind it. So it, it, in spite of the, these tremendous challenges, um, it is incredibly important um, because imagine a world like you know I'm, I, I work in what if right so imagine a world like what if the entire world is fueled by curiosity and and educate uh, curiosity is the, the the foundational aspect of all learning right well if that's true you know what if that were the case we would have a, a world where everybody wandering around you know is it, it would make education as natural as just wondering what if, right? And, and think back to yourself, how often you've asked what if, uh, even just on a daily basis. And, and if you're stuck and you haven't asked what if for a while, uh, think back to when you're a child, or if you have children, or you interact with young people. Think about how often they're, they're wondering and acting, you know, what if this, what if that, can you do this, what if, what if. Um, and if you realize that the curiosity-based learning is really taking every single what if question and using it as an entry point for deeper learning, um, I think it's really mind blowing and how much deeper learning we could have all over the world. So this is kind of my uh, my how I present curiosity based based learning. Um, and and um, be, before we get into some of the uh, demonstrations of what it looks like, uh, I'd also like to introduce a few of the uh, the guiding questions. Uh, I know a lot of uh, 
schools and businesses and groups, they'll have like a, 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 a guiding statement or some sort of statements, uh, mission statement, a vision statement to guide them. And, and I like that and I, I deal with those. Um, but again, dealing with what if and always questioning, I, I always wanted something a little less permanent, right? Uh, and instead of single statements that said, this is what I believe or this is what it's about, to use questions to keep, uh, and, and not just questions, but what if questions, um, to keep push, pushing the development and design of curiosity-based based learning forward. Um, so some of those, those questions I use to guide all that I do in, in the development of curiosity-based learning is, is first of all, is what if curiosity is a natural resource that can, can be converted into an energy? Um, and this is one that I, I, I can get a little, a few laughs now and then on, and, and I appreciate them, but I, I really mean this seriously. Um, when you think about, you know, what if curiosity is a natural resource? Uh, think about what that means, right? When you compare it to other resources or natural resources we have around the world, uh, it, it's, it's really remarkable what, what we could be tapping into with curiosity, um, especially when compared to other resources like, you know, oil or water or wind or some of these, you know, fossil fuels and these other things. And you think about, you know, what if we all have a, a potential source of energy within each one of us, right? And when you really look into what curiosity is and the role it plays in our lives, it's fascinating because it really doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, um, you know, where you grew up. It doesn't matter what religion you are, what culture you come from. It, it doesn't even, I, I like to laugh at this, it's like, it doesn't even matter how smart you are, right? I, I certainly don't consider myself one of the smarter people on, on the planet, but I do consider myself incredibly curious. Uh, and I've seen this in my students as well. I've seen students from all over, uh, all over the world. And, and the, the number one, with over 15 years in the classroom, the number one indicator of student success I've, I've been able to see isn't you know the, all these traditional ways we measure or we evaluate students on their success, but it, it's really just how curious they are. And I found without fail, that it's my most curious students who go on to find the most, um, and I'm doing air quotes here on, on success because by, by success, I'm really talking about overall satisfaction, right? Um, in terms of the occupations they find, um, the quality of life that they find beyond the classroom, um, there's a direct correlation between how, how curious they are and the success they experience later in life. So again, this is another one of those fuels for my passion is based on the experience of, of treating curiosity as a natural resource. Now, once we can understand it as a natural resource, the challenge becomes how do we de develop the processes and methodologies to convert it from a resource and into an energy? So that's the first guiding question. Um, after that question, we go to um, what if you want, whoops, what if you want to change the world? You have to start changing the world. Um, and sometimes people scratch their head and like kind of laugh and like say, no, duh. Uh, but again, I really mean this. And um, it's one of those things where it becomes cliche. You hear people talking about, oh, I want to change the world and, you know, let's change the world. But when you really start looking into it and ask them, well, what have you done to start changing the world? What kind of indicators do you have? Um, there really isn't anything, right? Um, if you want to be an innovative person, if you want to be a creative person, you know, you have to start innovating. You have to start creating. So if you want to change the world, well, start changing the world. And in, in what ways can you change? It's, you know, I, I did a TEDx talk many years ago and it's just about um, uh, not worrying about matching socks, right? And to me, that was one of these small world changing things that I guess I'm talking about here is that, that what if the smallest thing, the thing that you think is, is really insignificant, just by being able to make that change on, on the microscopic level is really the first step to making it on a more of a macroscopic level, right? And that, that if you're not willing or able to even change uh, the smallest things, then I guess you should ask yourself, how are we going to change these bigger things, right? So, you know, a lot of times we can be ambitious, like, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's change the way we educate or let's change, you know, the school systems or change this or that, and these big grand plans, which is fantastic. But then when you start going, all right, how are you going to do it? Or what have you done to start doing this? Um, there's little has been been done. So instead of shooting for the the overall big change the world project, um, let's take some steps to get there. Um, the next guiding question is, what if you can think it, you can do it. Uh, I love bringing this up, especially working with with, with kids um, and using kind of the power of curiosity and the power of what if and and not just as a powerful you know energy, but really as a step in a larger process. So this whole what if you can think it, you can do it, and. Ex 
example I love giving is, is asking, um, you know, what was the first step to, to humans, you know, walking on the moon? And, you know, people will think, well, you have to build a rocket, you know? And it's like, all right, yeah, well, you have to get a rocket. And before you build a rocket, what do you have to do? You know? Well, you have to, you know, study science or understand, you know, astronomy and they, all these things. But yeah, keep going back, keep going back. And if you go back far enough, really, the first step to, to walking on the moon was somebody on Earth, and this could have been tens of thousands of years ago, someone on Earth had to stare up at the sky and wonder, you know, what if, what if we could walk on that? You know, what if we could get there? What if, that, what if it's not made out of cheese, right? What if, what if the moon is something that, that we could travel to? Um, and it seems silly, but really that's the first step to getting on the moon. Um, and I, and sometimes I like to share the, the process and the work I do with what if is how do we develop processes to really shrink that time of say thousands, tens of thousands of years in this time from that question of what if we could walk on the moon to actually walking on the moon. So how do we develop processes? How do we develop mindsets and, and techniques so that we don't have to wait, you know, for so much time in between these curiosities and the action? Uh, so a lot of what we, every, you know, everything that we try to develop here and all the work we do in, in curiosity-based learning is to get to shrink that distance between the what if and what is. Uh, the next uh, question I have is, is what if collaborative competition beats zero sum every time? Um, this is something that whether I work with entrepreneurs or educators, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, I never want to get away from the, the concept or even there, there's power in com uh, competition, right? Um, there's, there's good that can come from competition. You know, for many people, competition can, can drive us, can push us forward. Help, it's what helps us innovate. Um, but getting away from this idea of zero sum, right? That just because maybe, you know, I'm a Cold War, war, world kid, yeah, Cold War kid, I should say. So I, I, I still remember growing up in a world that was, everything was black and white, right? Um, there was right or wrong. Um, there was Coke or Pepsi, <laughs> there was, you know, this or that. And um, it was everything would seem to be in this kind of uh, endless competition to where the goal was not for one to win, but for one to win and defeat the other. Um, and that may have worked for a while, but, you know, especially in education, you know, what if we got away from this? What if we looked at, you know, we can still be competitive, but what if we took a larger approach or understanding it so that, Competition was, you know, we could compete in ways that pushed us all forward uh, in different ways. Um, another one is, you know, what if there's always a better way? Uh, I love this question. I love it as an entrepreneur, as, a, as an educator, and uh, I hope to as a student, right? And this is the idea that, uh, you know, what if no matter what you did or what you produced or what, you know, what you're accomplishing, what if no matter how good or awesome it is, what if there's always a better way? Uh, and this doesn't mean that, you know, what if you did a bad job on it, but what if you, you're, you take this mindset, whether it's personal, it's in the classroom, or passing it on to your students, that, that no matter what you accomplish, there's, there, there's always ways to make it better, right? There's always ways to keep pushing it forward. And I think as educators, in many ways, this is what drives us, right? Um, you never... You never, you know, finish up a great lesson or a class and just say, all right, well, done. I'm never coming back here again, right? Uh, how do we keep finding ways to push us forward to create new and exciting ways to innovate? Um, what if there are no problems, only opportunities? Um, this can be a challenging one, of course, because some problems, especially in the moment, can seem terrifying, right? Um, but I do like to push people, you know, like, like, uh, what if, what if it's, it, all right, it's a problem and it's something that needs to be dealt with, but what if from this problem, and I'm sure as educators, you're probably already thinking, well, oh yeah, well, if there's a problem, there's an opportunity to learn from it, right? Um, so there's all, yeah, maybe there's an opportunity to learn. Maybe there's, there's some sort of insight that we can take from this spot and then apply it somewhere else. And, and again, this one can be challenging, but if we, it's also, I've seen it personally and with, with people I've worked with that you can really start training training your mind and your actions so that when problem, because, you know, let's face it, problems will occur, right? Things will come up. You, it doesn't take long being in a classroom before you, you have a, the best lesson plan ever or the best uh, activity, uh, you know, designed or something, and, and things will go wrong, right? But instead of getting frustrated uh, uh, 
or, or any other kind of um, distracting kind of thoughts? What if you looked at it as, as an opportunity, an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to find um, new possibilities? Um, another, I like to turn this cliche on its head, and what if our expectations are the box? As mentioned before, you know, we, we all hear, well, we got to think outside of the box. We got to do this outside of the box. But I think we can all be on board with that. But the problem is no one really defines what the box is. It just seems to be this kind of mysterious kind of thing. But, but what if we can define the box? What if we can say, all right, there is a, a box, and, and that box is our expectation. And the best way to start getting outside of the box is to find a way to get si outside of our expectations. Um, and this can be terrifying, you know, our, our expect, you know, what if our expectations are kind of our, our uh, security blanket, right? They provide us comfort, you know? Um, I like to say uh, real, like if you really want to get in that innovative spirit, you have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and that, that can be terrifying in itself to people, right? Uh, and when you, when you go into a situation with truly no expectations, I'll be honest, it can be terrifying. Uh, but that's also what outside of the box looks like. Um, what if curiosity is the beginning to all great learning? Um, this again, this is where my passion is, right? Uh, so all of this kind of leads up to this, this, this final question here of, um, you know, a lot of times you ask teachers, you ask uh, educators, learning communities, you know, what, where does learning come from? You're gonna get all these different answers. Um, a lot of times, unfortunately, we tie it to more traditional resources, right? Um, we need resources for our school. We need resources for our classrooms. We need, you know, all of this. But um, I think there's a lot of power in what if curiosity is the beginning to all great learning. Uh, I will admit my background is in the Peace Corps. So while I do work um, all over with schools and I, I'm, I'm even in the digital education space now and everything else, um, my earliest days in education was, you know, where we had no resources. Uh, I like to joke around, we didn't even have uh, um, erasers for the chalkboards. You know, we had a wet sponge with water and stuff. And, and uh, frequently, you know, no heat for the school or, you know, uh, students oftentimes couldn't afford the textbooks or any other resources. But, you know, at the end of the day, we still learn. And just unpacking that, it's like, well, how is that possible? It's like, well, we all brought our curiosity to the classroom. Uh, and really, that was kind of the, one of the early insights to what if curiosity is the beginning to all, all great learning. And, and again, I get passionate and excited about this because because also there's no uh, tie to the classroom. Or there's no tie to like traditional models of education. Um, this is really lifelong learning at its best. Um, so yeah, so what does it mean to be a teacher uh, or you know, bring curiosity-based learning into your classroom? Uh, and I do have some links to there. I should say that while curiosity-based learning is really new, there hasn't been a lot um, published out there on curiosity-based learning. So I have been able to find a couple sources that I like to cite in the presentations. Um, I know all this will be available online for you to dig deeper. Uh, and again, back to that invitation, if anybody's curious or interested in uh, working more to, to start getting more information out there and sharing, uh, whether it's research or other ideas on curiosity-based learning, I'm happy to work with you and see what we can do to really make some noise in this, this area. But what I have found is, is uh, it's some pretty simple stuff and powerful stuff, right? So a lot of times schools and educators, you know, they're overwhelmed. And it's like, oh, great, another thing, another thing we have to do, another thing we have to learn. And one of the things I like to stress is this doesn't mean, you know, a complete overhaul. This doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be that intensive. Really, the first step in, in, in bringing curiosity-based learning to your classroom is just a, a simple, and again, air quotes here, simple can be, you know, uh, theoretically simple, right? But it's really just a flip uh, in the philosophy of, of your role in the classroom. Uh, and uh, a, a flip in the role from one as a, an instructor, a teacher, I love the quote here, as a director or dictator, <laughs> uh, to one as, as a, truly a facilitator of students' learning process. And um, I've got some visuals to kind of show you here in, in just a bit of what that means or what that looks like to move. And I'm sure many of you already have this in your mind right now, what that looks like. Uh, I would expect many of you already consider yourself more of a facilitator uh, in the classroom. Uh, but, but I do want to share this because as we, we get into some of the processes, I want to have this available for you to reflect on how these uh, curiosity-based uh, learning methodologies and processes uh, play into this. Um, and before we get to those visuals, though, I do want to also share this, this uh, 
quote from the Harvard Business Review. I think I mentioned I, I work both in ed, my background's in education and I've been getting more into uh, social entrepreneurship. So I kind of straddle these. I refer to myself sometimes as an edupreneur, um, trying to blend different methodologies and approaches, um, you know, resources from the education and entrepreneurship together. So I, I end up getting all kinds of you know, different uh, inputs of, of information. And one of my favorites is this quote from the Harvard Business Review where, where again, it's really, while it's, it's stating some ideas, um, it's really more a call for more information, a call for research, a call for investigation. So this is, this is really exciting. Um, we're all familiar with IQ, um, good, bad, or you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I think in the last uh, decade or two, do, we, we've all probably heard a lot more about EQ and the importance of emotional intelligence. Um, but it's, it's really refreshing here to see that this idea of CQ or curiosity uh, quotient is, it could potentially be the ultimate tool to produce simple solutions for complex problems. And, and in many ways for 21st, uh, you know, 21st century learners and, and, and um, learning skills, this is what we want out of our students, right? This is what we want out of our teachers. How do we produce simple solutions for complex problems? Um, because the world is complex. It's full of complex problems that our lives are becoming uh, you know, faster and faster. And we're having less and less time to, to really find these, these solutions to these problems. So how, you know, and what if curiosity is the, the key to do this? Um, but as, as you see here, nobody's really nailed it down. Um, and that's driving the work that I do and excite, why I'm excited to connect with all of you to start exploring the possibilities of how we can continue growing this, growing this forward. Um, so what this looks like, uh, curiosity-based learning, before I get into like what, what the models look like, I think it, it's, it can be helpful to reflect back on just the traditional models of education. Um, this is how I learned, right? And I'm sure you can spot several problems or issues as an innovative educator that you have with this model. Um, one I always like to point out is, is this teacher as the dictator. You can see, um, for one, there's, there's only one source of information getting into the teacher. And then kind of like that game of telephone, right? The, the, the teacher or the dictator becomes the, the cheesecloth or the filter choosing what her students get to learn or, or are exposed to and what but they don't. And even if this is the best teacher in the world, even if this is the most open-minded, sharing, loving, everything else educator in the world, um, there's still gonna be limitations, uh, both on, on what she's able to, to communicate or allow to her teachers, but also the, uh, the information coming in. And again, I gotta give a big thanks to, to Teachers College for exposing me to Paolo Freire, uh, and the pedagogy of the oppressed, and, and much of my, uh, my, my, my learning at Teachers College is, is informing what I'm doing here. Uh, when you read about Freire's uh, idea of banking, the banking model in, in education, why we need to change that and providing more ownership to students and their learning, um, a lot of this is inspired by that thought. So this is the model that we're working for, right? This is, the, this is what we're, we're, we're shooting toward. How do we create learning experiences that look more like this? Uh, multiple sources of information coming in, and it's filtering from the student and then to the teacher, rather to the teacher and then back to the student. And I'll pause here just to, so you can reflect a little on this. I know I'm talking a little, uh, I'm throwing a lot of information at you, but um, when creating classroom experiences and designing activities, I, again, this is this is what's in the back of, of my mind and. Uh, part of sharing this with all of you is to encourage you to kind of keep this framework in your mind as you're doing the day-to-day -day and designing activities for your students. So how can we how can we create experiences that look like this within the classroom? And because I realize we have we have realities we have to work work within. You know, uh, uh, many times we have we have exams, we have standards, we have administrators, we have bosses, we have you know we have people that have to kind of oversee what we do. I always like to, to, to share that just because we're innovating and in how we're, we're, we're teaching and, and sharing information and, and drawing our students, you know, minds and, and understanding, it doesn't mean it has to be completely out there where nobody can recognize it, right? Um, as you can follow here clockwise, uh, even though you use curiosity-based learning or even you, though you bring curiosity in the classroom, doesn't mean that we can't still 
produce traditional outcomes and traditional results and, and have something to hold up and show to, you know, to produce, to assess, to uh, uh, edit and to reiterate. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean, even though it, it's, we're starting from a very radical starting point, um, the, the, the outcomes don't have to be radical. In fact, they should be, you know, they should, they should be recognizable. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit on kind of the background that leads up to, to some of these processes. And what I'd like to do right now is there's a couple processes that I'm going to walk you through. So I'm going to share, I'm going to, I'm going to take you through it. Um, uh, and I'm going to, there, I'm going to introduce the first slide and what I'm going to ask all of you, if you have a, uh, a, a piece of paper, something to draw with or kind of doodle with, it, it's going to be very handy in the next part because the, the first process that I'm going to introduce to you, um, is interactive. So if everybody can just take a quick second to grab a, a pencil or a pen, crayon, whatever you have, and, and access some sort of, of paper, um, I'd like to introduce the, the activity. Okay. So we're going to get into our what if minds. And, and regardless of how old you are, I want you to imagine, get back, you're a student again, right? You're back in when school was fun. Yeah. And imagine walking in. And your teacher just saying, let's say it's science class, and you're just asked, what if, what if there was a creature called a leafy sea dragon? And then take a second, I'll give you about a minute, and take a second and imagine what a creature like this may look like. And go ahead and just take a minute to draw what you think a leafy sea dragon might look like. So everybody should have, it doesn't have to be fancy, right? But everybody should have some sort of just simple picture. Now, if you can find another space on that same paper, ask yourself, or I'd like to you draw a second picture, right? What if, whoops, what if there was a leafy sea dragon and it had a head that looked like a horse? And, and what if it, its snout was much thinner and longer than a horse's? And what if it had a pectoral fin on its back and a dorsal fin near its tail? And what if it had fins that are transparent or nearly invisible? And what if this leafy sea dragon had about 10 or 15 bony rings that surrounded its body and large sharp spines that ran along its back, right? And what if this leafy sea dragon has a bunch of skin filaments kind of hanging off of its head and body and tail that looks like blades of seaweed. And what if this leafy sea dragon changes its colors from yellow to brown and green, all depending on its diet, its location, and whether it's stressed or how it feels? What would that look like? Take another 30 seconds, minute or so, and draw a second picture, now that you have a little more information of what you think that would look like. Okay, and unfortunately, I think I, uh, 
I think I, I ruined the surprise uh, just a little bit for everybody. But the next part of this, the process is to cho show students an, act, an image of an actual VPC dragon. And this is kind of like we call that aha moment. And it's, I love doing this live because especially with students, when you get to the slide, you can just hear the sound of discovery, right? You can just hear students, go, oh, wow, ooh, ooh, all of the, these sounds. And it's, I liken to it, it's like a, it sounds like a, you know, like a, like a Christmas morning or a birthday, you know, when people are opening their presents and stuff because they go along this process and they, you know, they, they keep wondering and they're creating all these, these uh, images of their own, but then they see this thing. And remember it was couched as what if. Um, they didn't know or have any idea if it was real or not. It was still very much in their own minds and they created this and then they see this image and it becomes real to them all of a sudden. Uh, and then the last step of the process is this. This is where I give the students all of the facts about the leafy sea dragon. This is where I share with my students what I want them to learn. This is what um, the lesson's about, right? And this is, I hate saying it this way, but this is what's going to be on the test. And now once we get to this part, the students are soaking this in like a sponge, yeah? And the reason is, remember, what if all great learning starts with curiosity? The reason they're soaking in this information now is because rather than starting with this information, we started with their curiosity. What do you think? What can you imagine? What if this were real? What would it look like? And I like to point out too, is, is even though this is a, a linear four-step process, step one, step two, step three, step four, inevitably, students never go from step three to step four. It's funny, students usually go from step three all the way back to step one. And I love it because the first thing they do is when they go back here is they laugh. And not only do they laugh, but they laugh at who got it the most wrong, right? They laugh at whose original picture was the craziest, was the most off from what the reality is and all of this. And we're really flipping the entire classroom dynamic now. So now the student who doesn't know the answer, the student who might feel lost, the student that feels behind, or the student that feels all these other things or ashamed of what you know he or she knows or doesn't know, now they're the superstar, right? Now we're encouraging our students to take chances. We're showing them that failure is okay, right? Um, we're all going to fail. <laughs> I guess if you know what a leafy sea dragon is, maybe you get it right this first time. But instead of introducing a lesson or a concept to something about you better make sure, you know, squeezing that bar of soap too tightly and say you better make sure you get all this information down, we're starting from a point of comfort. We're starting from a point of acceptance. We're starting from a point of there's no wrong answer here. And regardless of what students put in this first block, there's opportunity for learning on each step of the way. Because even if it's different, we can make comparisons. Um, we can point out new words, new, new concepts. And students are learning this from a point of comfort rather than a point of fear. And going back to that idea that, you know, while this is a, it can be a radical new way to teach and everything else, it doesn't have to be uh, as uh, time consuming or overwhelming as a lot of new methodologies and approaches. Because I like to point out to, to teachers that, you know, we're already teaching this. The only difference is we're teaching in a different order, right? Traditional education starts here. This is what the lecture or the lesson is about, right? And then we tell our students to go home and read this or study this because there's going to be quiz on Friday. And then they come from the class and on Friday, here's the quiz. We give them a little information and then they fill in the blank with what they know, right? And we say we have to take this quiz because next, you know, the, the following week, there's going to be exam. And this is what the exam looks like, where you just get a blank piece of paper and you fill in all of the information you know. And then we use this to grade and assess the student's learning. And again, going back to that idea of what if uh, collaborative competition beats zero sum all the time, right? This traditional model is, is, is reinforcing this idea of zero sum, where we go from all of the information 
and slowly take it away to only a few of the students who are able to retain all of these details can achieve and, and produce the best results at the end. But if we look at it collaboratively, collaboratively, where the goal isn't to find the top two or three students, but to truly get everybody learning together, then why don't we start here and guide our students to where we want them to be? Just a little bit the background be behind uh, one of those techniques. And, and I do want to make sure I open, I leave some time for questions, but before I do, um, I want to show you one more technique. And if this looks familiar, it should. <laughs> so this is something I refer to as from what to wow. Um, I use this in a number of ways. I use this both to introduce a new concept or idea in the classroom, um, but I also use it to assess students' learning. So let's say there's gonna be a, a, a new concept, like, I don't know, maybe curiosity-based learning that nobody's ever heard about, right? So instead of just kind of going off in all these different directions or giving just a kind of a paragraph or whatever, um, you know, what if we were to explain the new concepts by answering each one of these questions in a single sentence? And then what if at the end of a lesson or the end of a unit, instead of giving a traditional quiz or exam where they you know, fill in the blank or write all this, we ask students to share what they know or understand about what was taught by answering a single sentence to each one of these questions. And the idea is that this can be done, and when I do this, there's, there's eight questions, um, one sentence. I typically give one minute per sentence, um, and then what happens is at the end of the 10 minutes, we have eight complete sentences that make an entire paragraph. And what we can do with this now is, you know, we all know there's six question words, right? I'm a weirdo, so I like to add <laughs> huh and wow. And what happens then is by answering or, or sharing your understanding of something by the, in these eight questions or eight sentences, answers to these questions, any response someone has back is going to automatically be a deeper level of, of, of response because every question has been answered in the communication of what it is. Um, in terms of teaching tools, I really enjoy this because when my students answer, especially the last two questions, what puzzles them or what terrifies them about something um, or what is exciting about them, I use these as tools then um, to increase my level of empathy to my students. If I know where they're scared, I can create lessons, experiences, um, activities to help kind of uh, decrease that, that fear. If I know what excites them, when I feel like I'm losing them or I need to kind of rope them back in, I have touch points to get them excited again. So this also becomes a template for me to create more effective uh, lessons and experiences inside the classroom. I also use it for writing. Yeah. Uh, again, my background is in writing as an English professor and, and writing teacher. Um, I'll use this in place of a traditional uh, outline for an essay or other writing assignments where they can write this out and then we can have them fill in between each sentence um, further, you know, deeper explanations or examples of what they mean. And we can use this as a, as a structure for, for more writing. Um, so this is, and also if, if anybody wants to go back, again, I, I'll share all these slides with you, but if you recall how I introduced curiosity-based learning to you, this is the exact method I followed. I first gave a single sentence on what curiosity-based learning is, who it affects, how it works, where it happens, when it, when it takes place, why it matters, what puzzles or scares me about it, and what I think is awesome in the opportunity. So again, if, once you have the slides, you can see kind of how I demonstrated this at the beginning as well. Um, before we go to questions, I just want to share just a little, I mentioned I was in the Peace Corps and the journey with Curiosity has been really crazy from there to here. Um, I do work with Curiosity all over the world and uh, in schools and communities. Um, you can find me even more 